Hit it, Phil. Da, 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 da. Can it be the breeze that fills the trees with rare and magic perfume? Oh, no. <laughs> it isn't the breeze. It's Jackson time. La, da, da, da. Well, hello again. This is Buck Benny speaking. I uh, have a nice full house today. Uh, we have uh, John Henderson here from This Day and Jack Benny. Oh. Hey, John. Um, so, John, uh, like, what? tell us this. What's your most recent episode covering? Uh, I'm doing 1945. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is uh, right uh, at the end of the war. Yes. And um, it's actually a really great episode. It really has nothing to do with the war other than that's just right. the time period in, it's in. And so I'm doing some research about well, the It's actually stuff. usually better if it has nothing to do with the war because the war episodes are all so si similar to each other. It's nice to yeah. get away from that. 45 is such an exciting time in Benny history because it's when they start introducing a lot of the new things. I think, isn't that the year that they introduce uh, Mel Blanc's character that we're going to actually have today which is professor yes, Blank. actually mm -hmm. the episode that just dropped is actually that episode the very first episode with wow. professor leblanc wow and wow. Uh, today we're going to present uh is this i think this is his first appearance on television maybe I of, think so. of leblanc he's on a number of episodes but this is the first one i remember seeing in our kind of sequential run so yeah uh and then we have kathy fuller seeley hey kathy Hi. Hey, Kathy. Um, and for you, what what classes are you in the midst of teaching now? Uh, trying to finish up one on classical Hollywood stars and fans. And uh, so we've been talking about Marilyn Monroe and similarities to Taylor Swift. And uh, uh, so, but they were really important. So Jack Benny came into the mix when I said his television show was so good and treated guest stars so well that Marilyn made her first, one of her uh, first and only TV uh, appearances on his show. Humphrey yep. Bogart made one of his only TV appearances on Jack's show. So I'm getting Jack, I'm representing Jack. You work Jack in there. <laughs> I still, of, of any job in the world, I think yours is one of the most interesting. I love that. Yeah. I have, we have some fun. <laughs> and then we have Terry Phillips back with us for the first time in a gazillion years. Hello, and hello. Great to see you, Terry. And Terry, his Imaginary Theater, he was just telling us, has a new episodes that are going to be dropping. There you go, Imaginary Theater. <laughs> and uh, and and, do you want to share anything about these new episodes, or keep them a surprise, or what do you? Mean? Well, I can say that it's uh, the first time we've done a, a four part miniseries, and as a result of that, uh, as Buck had speculated uh, quite some time ago, they keep getting longer and longer, and so this four parter. Will probably be about an hour long, all four episodes wow. combined. Nice, um, but they'll be you know in, in short segments, so that yeah. you, it won't. Be and he's still figuring out how he's going to drop them and all that kind of stuff. But that yeah, we're still surprise. mulling that over. Yeah, <laughs> excellent, uh, excellent. And and you have a, a co-writer this time, yes? That's right. Uh, since this is a historical drama, I have a, a retired history professor who uh, actually came up with the the theme for this one, yeah. and so we're we're working together on it Very cool. and i have uh as we're speaking um so this is uh april 20th 2024 which by the way is a palindrome date oh so it reads the same way forward and backward anyway uh at this moment we we have almost all of the files recorded and uh, so i have actually started cutting it together and i hope before the end of the month that yeah. um it should be out in the world and with any luck, this episode drops for us tomorrow. So we should be able to, I should be able to get it together and throw it out there. Last week's, I didn't know if I'd be able to pull it off, but I did. And then I realized, oh man, I've, I've aired the first episode of the season, the first week, the second episode of the season, the second week, third episode, third week. This is the fourth episode of the season. I can't just sort of start skipping around now. So <laughs> I'll, I'll play this one. But uh uh, I don't, I think I mentioned it. I at least mentioned it to our group, but I don't remember if I mentioned it in the actual uh, show. Uh, this season is one of the most unique seasons that we have of the Jack Benny show. Season six and seven somewhat, but six more, I think even more than seven. We have every single episode this season that was released except for one. And that one, I think if I remember right, 
might have been a, a kind of almost like a clip show sort of thing where it was like an old show linked to some new footage or something. So I don't even know if it's out there anywhere. I haven't been able to find it. But but certainly we have the, I think out of 16 episodes, we have 15 of the 16. So wow. that's pretty awesome. And that, that's a rarity. I mean, so often we have, oh, we have one episode this season, or maybe we have four out of the 15 that are available or something. It's, it's really nice to have a bunch of them in a row and to see what audience was it would experience from week to week to week and you can i mean we always talk about the broad variety and the popping around of subjects that jack would do but to actually experience it kind of in real time where you're like oh wow okay episode two was a lot different than episode three and episode one was live and uh we're this one is of course not a live episode this episode is a filmed episode um i think uh, this one when we present it to you, I think it's going to be about the best video quality that they have of this episode on all of YouTube. So hopefully you'll get a chance to see it really clear. Uh, anyway, like we said, uh, Professor LeBlanc's on this episode. Love it when Professor LeBlanc appears. And and uh, Mel does such a good job of taking a character that was made for radio, made famous in radio, and bringing it over and pretty much the way I kind of saw him in my head is very similar to the way he appears on the show. So then that seems kind of a rarity. So anyway, we'll pop it around and see what folks think of this episode. I mean, the big thing this episode is, of course, Isaac Stern is uh, the guest star of the episode sort of thing. And they do a pretty um, innov innovative way to, to use him. Uh, as I'm watching it, I, I in my head anyway, I was thinking, okay, I, I can predict a lot of what's going to happen and things. But there was a few plot turns here and there. And they, it, even if it was something that I was kind of expecting, it was uh, very pleasantly presented. Um, and that, that was nice. And and the fact that Mary's on this episode too, right, if I remember right? Yeah. So, and we don't get a lot of Mary, but... We're going to have her a little bit this season, which is nice. All right, let's 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 go to uh, John and see what his thoughts were on this thing. Well, it's so great to see Mary. I love all the episodes that she's in. Uh, I, I was thinking that uh, compared to radio, especially the early days of radio, uh, when she's in television, she's a lot less harsh. You mm -hmm. know, it's so fun to hear her ribbing Jack and things like that, although it's kind of softened on television. And I don't know whether it's just something that I'm you know, perceiving or reading into it just because I see her face now or whether it actually is the case. I'll have to keep an eye on that. But uh, it, it seems like there's more love between them on the television episodes than on the radio episodes, which, which is I really like, great. which is very good. Yeah, I'm, it, I'm glad they do that. Like and part of it, John, could be, too, as I was thinking the same thing, I thought, could it be just does she deliver very similar lines sometimes, but just by seeing her face and how she's obviously joking about it that it makes it s just seem softer as well but yeah. i also think the writers just aren't writing her nearly as aggressive either yeah. it's it's I both think we're things. gonna on the next episode we're gonna see a good example of that of that slight change yeah, so, yeah. Uh, the uh next the vapor season. rub omelet is mm -hmm. is a, a, a good point a good one that they did in both show um, on yeah. radio and television so yeah yeah yeah, um, but I agree. I love uh, Professor LeBlanc. I think it's a great uh, physical adaptation of that radio character. To the, and Mel Blanc, even in his facial expressions, does such a good job at like, that suffering, just sort of like yes. that, uh, that, that put upon uh, man. And it's so funny. And I loved it. And this is, I think, one of the great episodes, if not the top episode, like along of all classic television. So that's probably one of the reasons why the picture quality is so good. It's preserved because it's one of the best. Okay. Uh, I just, as a filmed episode, it's crystal clear. Um, it's, it, it almost seems like the other television shows of the time that are, you know, on reruns all the time. Yes. Uh, because it's a lot more slick than maybe some of the other Jack Benny episodes. And it all is cohesive and, and yeah this is what i think one of the great classic episodes well and that's i think this season the the filmed episodes where they tried to make them like a sitcom sort of thing and not go with jack in front of the curtain and the whole thing i think are the slickest 
of all the episodes ever done on the Jack Benny show that yeah. seem the most, like you say, like it could be in, it fits right in with I Love Lucy or or, or that yeah. sort of thing. And so. yet he's in front of the curtain at the end of this one. Yes. At the so, end of this one, yes. So. But he's not at the beginning, right? No, no. it's to no, no. come at the beginning yep. and then appear. So uh, he yeah. just can't get away from that curtain. It follows him everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> You know, in the old days, uh, I used to skip past the uh, Dennis Day songs just yeah. to get to the comedy. Uh, mm -hmm. But now I listen to them. I, I enjoy it. It's part of the experience. But I will say this time I did skip past the Isaac Stern violin playing. Not that oh. it was bad, but uh, I think I think there was something wrong with my phone. It wasn't keeping up and it was just not in <laughs> sync and it drove me nuts. I couldn't oh. handle it. <laughs> oh dear oh dear you you and most of america in 1955 so that's a, <laughs> yeah. this classical music stuff so. yeah. well it, it was nice i thought that jack featured that it was like let's have the the episode essentially we're going to get yeah. the the main part of the episode told we're going to give you a, a story that's entertaining that you're kind of used to and then we're going to save some time at the end to, to have isaac actually play us some music which is lovely. But with the close-ups from two different directions of Isaac playing, I really appreciated that they were trying to bring in the effort, the skill that I wouldn't understand, you know, right. as as a non-violin player. But as I said, the special effort they made during that last final performance to to look at it. And I especially love the fact that it showed that uh, Isaac had this adorable double chin on the side. Yes. So. <laughs> I was wondering though, like, because of my, I think my sound was off just like a half of a second. And so when Jack was playing, I wasn't sure whether he was dubbed with like really bad playing or whether he was actually doing it. It, I don't know if you guys could tell. You're right. The second time I thought it was somehow enhanced with badness, you know, the. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> even more than he could produce. So Jack's yeah, well, not bad was, enough. Dump on more badness. Yeah. We need more badness. It was funny either way. I, I liked yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> Terry, what were your thoughts on this one? Well, I'm going to be a little bit of a spoiler here, um, in both senses of the word. First of all, I'm I'm uh, going to do that thing that I hate when I read it on you know, like IMDb. Well, you know, he was looking left and then he was looking right and they yeah. should have edited that better. The, so the one thing that that irritated me um, was when um, they're waiting for Isaac Stern to come to the house, but Jack has gone out and the doorbell rings and Mary says, oh, I hope that's not Jack because they don't want him to be there before right. Right. Isaac Stern arrives. And the thing that irritated me about that was, why would Jack be ringing the doorbell of his own house? Oh yes. yes. <laughs> so yeah. I thought that was a that was an odd, you know, a thing plot. to throw in there. Yeah, yeah. But that's a radio thing. So that you're right, but that that you would need that on radio because indeed you would see it, but but you'd need. I suppose. Yeah. I suppose. I suppose that's, that's still point. still. You need bottom. to realize. Oh, we don't need to bring that across. People will see. <laughs> so, yeah. But on the other hand, I, the one of the things I loved about this episode was how many visual gags there were, and there were there there was one joke that had me on the floor when uh, I, I really don't want to spoil this, yeah. but when he's um, about to leave, he has a wonderful play on words uh, about the script that uh, that he's been sent to to read by his yes. producer. Yeah. So uh, just be yeah. prepared for, be prepared for a, for a belly laugh talk about there. The Listen in, yeah. A couple of wonderful sight gags at the recording studio, the 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 sensitivity gauge with uh, low, medium, and danger. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then smoke coming out at the smoking, end of the, I love the, the, of the speaker vibrating on the wall. I mean, they're just beautifully, beautifully done. And and on the whole, um, I, I agree with, with all of you. This was a fantastic example of really well done both both in terms of technical quality and and content the approach to this was was terrific i want to throw in one last uh, uh note to john i i uh, by contrast loved watching and listening to isaac stern play my mom played violin i actually took violin lessons when i was a kid the violin is a is as jack said it's it's difficult you have to practice all the time just to be lousy Yes. And, and I was, um, but I, I very much enjoyed him uh, 
playing at the end is to the point where I wanted to find examples of other people playing that same piece. And I found Yasha Heifetz doing it. And then this young Korean woman, um, who is also a classical violinist, uh, did it. And it's such a hard piece to do. And it was just so great to see um, Isaac Stern do it on well, the show. It takes all kinds Find of people to make the world, I guess. Uh, I actually, my daughter plays the violin. I would say ah. that she's not quite as good as Isaac Stern, <laughs> but better than Jack Benny. So in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kathy, what were your thoughts on this one? Well, I I love this. I, it's been a long time since I'd seen it. So it was great to see it again. It really struck me that this is one of the more visual episodes. You couldn't have just stolen this as a radio script because how would you understand Isaac Stern in the closet? You needed to see that. And even though the, the recorder was a bit clunkily done, they said it, it kind of worked better visually than, than if it had just been a radio, sh radio show. Yeah. Um, Laura's, uh, Laura Leibowitz's wonderful collection on Benny's TV shows claims this is the last time Isaac Stern appears on the show. And so I'm wondering, was he on a special or one of the Shower of Stars? I hope this is not the last interaction we have filmed between uh, Jack and Isaac. Because wasn't it Isaac who um, organized the Carnegie Hall show? So yeah. I know that, you know, that it can't have been the last appearance yeah. of the two together. And they did but, perform together. I think they did fundraisers together for various yes. causes. Yes. Oh. So so I'm 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 glad about but that. But it might be the last of the half hour official yeah. Jack so, Benny shows. But, but whatever. But he um Isaac Stern has such a marvelous twinkle in his eye and that marvelous line about, oh, I'd hate to see his baby blue, you know, beautiful baby blue eyes <laughs> sad or whatever that yeah. it was just, he said it was such a smile on his face. Yeah. I thought that was adorable. Um, and uh, so they ended up, they, um, uh, Laura's book says that they um, had filmed this episode back the previous August, August 20th, 1955. So mm -hmm. no wonder Mary is able to be on and to look more um, uh, relaxed that I think she was willing to do these shows when you didn't have to appear in front of a live audience. Yeah. Uh, so I appreciated uh, uh, that, and um, oh, and also the fact that here it's night prime time, uh, prime time comedy, and here is one of the world's greatest violinists playing a serious number. Mm -hmm. I just thought, who else could have pulled that off so beautifully? Uh, uh, as Isaac Stern, I wanted to indeed mention the um, the close up cuts to the diff, you know, to trying to somehow just show us the the difficulty in the um musicianship and the finger work that it took to uh with the cameras over uh, yeah. uh, uh isaac's shoulder one way or the other and there's also something interesting so they filmed that on a live stage because you hear a live audience applaud him but then when jack does the final comment it's back to the fake audience plugged in so it was just kind of interesting to hear where uh the uh, sitcom, you know, I mean, the canned sitcom audience, ha uh, ha, moved to the live audience appreciating uh, that they must have, they had done the Isaac Stern performance in front of a live audience on the yeah. stage. Kathy, excuse me for interrupting, but I've read that when they did these filmed episodes, they would bring in an audience to watch the filmed episode. It wasn't the same kind of canned laughter that was typically used on sitcoms. I'm not sure that's true, but I've read that. Well, it's, but this one, you're very right, but this one, it, if we go back and listen to it again, it sounded canned. But as I said, the interesting part was to me mixing in that final scene on stage, yeah. the real laughter of a, of a sounded like a live audience, plus a little sweetening at the end that uh -huh. maybe they hadn't responded to joke to Jack's last joke well enough. And so you got to spice it up with a little. Yeah. And it makes you stuff. wonder if they show, if they filmed the episode, the sitcom part and played that for the audience and then had isaac stern come out and perform live and film that at with the live audience i don't know they could have i don't know I mean, it's the I, kind I, of let me put it this way i wouldn't yeah. put it past jack jack does all kinds of crazy things so who knows what sure. it's just the kind of and thing i think he just makes... says do it this way and the and his yeah. directors and producers and stuff are like okay yeah. this is weird but we'll do it <laughs> it's the kind of thing that makes you wish you had production records 
yeah. from either happening at, t at a television studio, you know, at CBS studio or in Jack's own papers. I wish we had production records. Yeah. Well, and, and just to throw something out there, since we're always talking about production and everything, I, uh, on, uh, Amazon prime, they have, uh, I think it's called Desi Lou is the, is the, uh, title of this documentary. And it's really good documentary about how they filmed the Lucy show about, and it really focuses on Desi and Lucy's relationship, but also their business relationship and everything. Okay. And it's, it's a straight, it's not like, it's a straight documentary. And, uh, and a lot of it, I think it was done essentially because uh, Lucy's daughter uh, is in a lot of it and and talks a lot as she goes through but they talk about how uh, Desi and Lucy had all these audio tapes that they would create where they would talk about how they're doing the show and all these things oh, wow. and and so they said what are you ever going to do with these things and they said well they so so there's huge parts of the show that are those audio tapes and that that they'll have like a still pictures to go with them to emphasize whatever they're talking about like he would say, oh, uh, we decided to use three cameras and have them doing this. And then he would show the three camera setup that they would use and stuff while he was talking about it. Yeah. And uh, Lucy would talk about why they were doing the show in a certain way. And then they would do that. And and they boy, the audio on those uh, was preserved very nicely. And so it sounds great. And it sounds like they're talking to you today about how they did things so it's an I, interesting I sure wish we, show if you like behind the scenes stuff yeah wow i sure wish we had things like that apparently laura got to see a different version because yours was taped off the air the one you showed us yes but apparently why i wish we could see the one with the original commercials is that um laura says that in the middle commercial jack actually sings light up a lucky oh huh. And that would have been cute to hear. Yeah, it's yeah. Time, be yeah. happy, go lucky. <laughs> I, I will do a quick scan of of YouTube and just see if someone's got the whole thing out there and Frankenstein that part in if if <laughs> if it exists. But I looked the other night and I don't remember oh seeing anything God. that wasn't the same episode, just in UCLA. worse quality. So. <laughs> All right. Um, well, uh, anything else you want to cover on this one or we got that pretty good? You think? I think we got the, the episode covered. I did want to mention this reminded me of a record that Jack Benny released, uh, yeah. assisted, ably assisted by Isaac Stern, where he uh, he goes to like a gypsy and he's a bad violinist and they give him the uh, the power to uh, to uh, play beautifully. And so we hear him playing, but it's actually Isaac Stern. And so mm -hmm. there's there's a huge chunk of just violin playing, so uh, you guys will love that. And then uh, at the end, the one caveat is he's not allowed to play the B, but the audience is demanding that he plays the B. So he plays it, <laughs> and he's back to being a bad violin. <laughs> <laughs> That's fabulous. Where'd you find that, John? I just found it on YouTube. Um, okay. I So I... I Do you posted know what the title is or anything when like I that? Patreon. I, so I think I I might have played it in the summer on my podcast. I wish I could remember the title of it. I've actually got it here for you. It's called uh -huh. Jack Benny Fiddles with the Classics. Yes. Oh. And uh, Daryl, I'll drop it into the chat if you want to share that in your show notes. Yeah, that'd be great. Fantastic. That'd be perfect. Thank you so much. Fantastic. And then uh, and I'll dink around and try and find the copy with the best quality sound that I can and stuff. But yeah. Because who knows, we'll present it at the end of this episode. I don't know. So don't get your hopes up. But if I get back <laughs> together and pull something like that off, great. So because <laughs> it makes sense. It's Isaac Stern still. So um, all right. Well, uh, we will let folks enjoy this episode. Um, oh, I wanted to throw out one more thing there about Mary. It's kind of cool that Mary sort of towards the mid 50s, well, when they started filming episodes really, right? Uh, she starts appearing like more and more and more. And, and so she's pretty heavy in these 55, 56, 57, 58 time frame. But then I think, uh, I can't remember, it's 58 or 60 where she stops doing the show entirely. I think it's 60. Um, but at least she was on the, a, lot of, a lot of those filmed episodes. And whoever had any hand in putting together the syndication package 
picked a lot of the Mary episodes to to put in there. And so uh, so for a decent chunk of the uh, syndication package where people see them on TV, they do get to see Mary and probably get the feeling that she was on more shows than she really was because they're getting a smaller subset of the Jack Benny shows that feature her more. And so it's like, okay, so you feel like, oh, she must have been on there every fourth episode. It's like, no, not really. <laughs> anyway, all right. Well, enjoy, and we'll see all you folks next time. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>
Professor LeBlanc, what a temper. Where's the professor? He's gone. Well, we didn't see him come out. He didn't use the door. What? <laughs> The professor could have sprained his ankle. Mary, after a man cuts his wrist, what's an ankle? <laughs> now go downstairs and fix some lunch. Maybe you'll feel better. I don't want any lunch. You go ahead, Rochester. Fix him some lunch. Yes, ma'am. Mary, I told you I don't want any lunch. I just want to be left alone. Oh, calm yourself, Jack. You're all upset. Well, of course I'm upset. Why wouldn't I be? All my life I've dreamed of being a great violinist. I'm a nothing. No technique, no tone, no talent. And you... Well, don't argue with me. I'm on your side. <laughs> don't be funny. Well, Jack, where are you going? I don't know. I gotta think this thing out. Oh, but Jack, wait a minute. Oh, Jack, don't be so... Hello, Rochester. Hello, Miss Lucy. Come on in. Mr. Benny feeling any better today? No, it's the same thing. Every morning he gets up, won't eat his breakfast, then leaves the house. He goes out to the park, sits on the bench all day brooding. That's where he is now. Well, that's good. It'll give us a chance to do that idea you thought about. And you know, Rochester, we've got to convince Mr. Benny that he's a great violinist. Well, I've got the recording machine. Did you get someone to cooperate? I got just the man, Mr. Isaac Stern. You know, he's one of the world's greatest violinists and a very good friend of Mr. Benny's, and I'm sure he'll help us out. I called him, so he should be here any minute. Good, then I'll set up the recording machine. I hope everything works. You know, Mr. Benny isn't even tend to business. His producer sent this play over, and he won't even look at it. Uh-oh. Oh, never mind. I'll get it. Hope it isn't Mr. Benny. It'll ruin everything. Hello, Hello Mr. Stern. Come on in. How are you? You know Rochester. Sure. How are you, Rochester? Hello, Mr. Stern. Well, Mary, when you called me and asked me to hurry over with a violin, I gathered that it was most urgent. Well, it is. You see, three days ago, Jack found out he wasn't a great violinist. Only three days ago? <laughs> well, he's very upset over it, but I think with your help, why, we might snap him out of it. Well, Mary, you know how I love Jack. And if there's anything I can do to bring the twinkle back to those big blue eyes of his, <laughs> no, I'd be very happy to do it. Well, thanks a lot, but we better hurry. He might be here any minute. Fine. So Jackson isn't really in a bad mood, is he? Yes, sir. All because he found out he's a lousy violinist. Rochester, lousy is a very harsh word. Appropriate, but harsh. <laughs> uh, what's this plan you have in mind? Well, it's very simple. You see, this is a recording machine. Yes, I know. It starts here. No, 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 no Mr. Stern. That's the volume. Oh, I'm sorry. This is a switch. Mm -hmm. Now, if you'll get your violin out and play a solo, I'll make a record of it. And when Mr. Benny comes, I'll coax him into playing the same number and tell him I'm making a recording. Oh, I see. And when you, when you play it back, it'll actually be me playing. That's right, and Jack will think he's terrific. Well, that's a cute idea. That's very clever. Now, if you're ready, Mr. Stern, we can start sure. recording. Uh-oh. Uh, Jack's what? coming up the walk now. Well, what are we going to do? I haven't made a record yet. See, I've got an idea, Mr. Stern. I think it'll work just as well. What is it? You hide in the closet, and I'll get Mr. Benny to play something and... Make believe that I'm making a record of it. And when you hear me say playback, you play the same thing that Mr. Benny played. Well, I'm willing to try it. Well, good luck, fellas. I'm going out the back way. <laughs> Goodbye, Mary. Now, Mr. Stern, you get your violin and come out in here. Okay. Now, if you get hungry, there's a candy machine right behind the vacuum cleaner. <laughs>
Chester. Oh, hello, boss. How do you feel? How do you expect me to feel? A man spends his whole life dreaming and planning and hoping that someday he'll become a great musician. And then everything smashes in front of him. Boss, you can't go on like this. Look, I can go. Hey, what's this? Oh, this is a recording machine. I bought it from a friend of mine to prove to you what a great violinist you are. Me? <laughs> I know what I sound like. But that's just it, boss. You don't know what you sound like. What? When you play your violin, you're too close to it. You're concentrating on your fingering and your bowing. You're too occupied to hear the beautiful music that comes out. <laughs> really? Get your violin and play something. This machine will make a record of it, and you'll be able to hear for yourself how beautiful it sounds. Oh, wait. Don't let me get your violin for you. It's just lying here gathering dust. <laughs> no, come on, play something. Come well, on. Well, oh, oh, this is silly. No, no, come on, play something. Uh, now, here's the microphone. Mm -hmm. See? And then you just... Uh, uh, no, 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 boss. Uh, it'll pick up better if you see if you stand facing this way. <laughs> it's, uh, it's right about... Uh, it's right about here. <laughs> That's it. Uh, too close to it. Now, you just sit down and listen to it. Oh, this is ridiculous. No, just close your eyes. Turn around this way. Yeah, relax. <laughs> and listen to the playback. That's wonderful. I can't believe it's me. <laughs> the fingering is perfect, but I'll have to work on the bowing a little bit. It sounds a trifle crammed. studio, I have to pass my producer's office. And as far as I'm concerned, he can have his playback. <laughs> Roger, 
Rochester. What's that? Uh, recording machine. Stop it! Stop it! Hold it! Hold it! Play off! Play off! Play off! How could a machine start by itself? Uh, uh. <laughs> Loose switch. Well, I don't want to waste any more time. I'm going to the recording. Well, thank heavens that's over. Are you really gone? Yeah, Mr. Stern, but I, I think we overdid it. Why? He's on his way to a recording studio to make records. Oh, no. Well, I don't want to be here when he gets back. I'm going now. Well, if you wait a minute, I'll walk along part of the way with you. Why, where are you going? To an unemployment office. I might as well get plenty with him now. <laughs> Uh, Jack Benny and his magic violin. <laughs> Take one. <laughs> What's the matter? What's the matter? I never heard anything so awful in my life. <laughs> well, I've got news for you, bub. I mean, you've been concentrating so much on my fingering and bowing that you couldn't hear what was coming out. Now, wait till you hear the playback. What? Playback. Uh, Jack Benny and his magic violin. Take one. Darn right it's bad. I don't know where you got that engineer, but he's off. He doesn't even know how to make a recording. <laughs> yes, I guess you're right, Mr. Benny, but uh, he's the best we could get, and we have to do the best we can with what we've got, and, uh, <laughs> well, you know how it is. That's yeah, a shame, but I, I guess you're stuck. <laughs> well, good day, Mr. Benny, and thanks for coming in. You're welcome. have such an incompetent engineer, I'll never know. <laughs> Must have been the engineer. When I made the record on this machine, it sounded beautiful. <laughs> Just beautiful. I want to hear it again. Let's see, how does this work? Now, oh, there it is. Now, Mr. Stern, if you'll get your violin out and play a violin solo, I'll record it. Oh, and when you play it back to Mr. Benny, it will really be me playing. You hide in the closet. I'll get Mr. Benny to play something, and when you hear me say playback, you play the same thing Mr. Benny played. So that's it. They tricked me. 
Oh, Rochester! <laughs> Come in here, I want to talk to you. What about? You know what about. Come in here. Take off that silly thing and fix me some dinner. You mean you're not mad with me? No, I guess not. After all, you did it for my own good. Anyway, it serves me right for being such a big ham. If I hadn't gone to that recording studio, I'd have kept on thinking that I was a great violinist. But you are a great violinist. Oh, shut up. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I also want to thank Mr. Isaac Stern, one of the world's truly great violinists, for being such a good sport. I'd like to have you meet him again, and maybe he'll play an encore for us. Mr. Isaac Stern. Uh, Isaac, I do want to thank you very, very much for being on my show. It was my pleasure, Jack. And you know, now I have the distinction of being the only violinist who's played in the Hollywood Bowl, the Philharmonic Auditorium, Carnegie Hall, and Jack Benny's Closet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, Isaac, I'm sure that um, all of us would like to hear... Oh, do you mind if I look at your violin just Not a moment? Not at all, Jack. Uh, just be careful. <laughs> yes, yes, I will. Beautiful tone. Oh, it's a wonderful instrument. Great help to me. It's, it's cheap, though, isn't it? Cheap? Uh, inside here, it says 1737. That's the year. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> sorry. Now, Isaac, I, I am sure that all of us now would like to hear you play a number without interruption. And I'll stand over there and listen. Fine. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, with the assistance of my longtime colleague, Mr. Alexander Zarkin, we'd like to play for you the Polonaise Brillante in D major by Wieniawski.
I think that was wonderful. Thank you, Jack. Pleasure. I must practice. <laughs> Good night. Jack Benny, and I'm going to play my violin for you. Now, let's see. What should I play? How about the Minuet by Paderewski? Jack, Jack, is that playing necessary? Why don't you put your fiddle away and give us some peace and quiet? But, Mary, I was just trying... That try screeching drives me crazy. Well, really, Let I... Let me ask you something, Jack. Where'd you ever learn to play the violin like that? Didn't you practice when you were a child? Well, of course I practiced. I was... Well, you certainly don't sound like it. Well, since you bring it up, there was something that happened to me when I was a child that affected my violin playing. Would you like to hear about it? Yes, yes. Anything but listening to that fiddle. Promise not to laugh. I promise. Well, you see, it was this way. About uh, 32 years ago, when I was only uh, seven years old... <laughs> Mary, you promise. Anyway, I took my very first violin lesson. Professor LeBlanc was teaching me then, and... That is fine, Jackie. You seem to take to the violin quite naturally. Uh, thank you, Professor LeBlanc. I like the violin very much. I just know I'll become a great musician. Yes, I am sure you will. Now, once again. Well, that was the beginning of my musical career. I worked hard practicing every single day. And within a year, I had shown great improvement. I was playing solos, and Professor LeBlanc was quite proud of me. All right, Jackie. Play your new piece for me. Uh, now I will accompany you on the piano. Yes, Professor LeBlanc. I've worked hard on it all week. Listen to this. went on, I got better and better, and Professor LeBlanc decided I needed a finer violin, a full-sided one. So he sent me down to old Mr. Schultz, the violin maker, to pick one out for myself. My ear was so good that he felt I could pick out the best violin without any help. The first violin I tried was too harsh. Mr. Schultz, don't you have one with a softer tone? This one isn't quite right. Yeah, sure, Chucky. Here, you try this one.
Mr. Schultz, this one is too soft. Say, how about that very old one in the glass case? Let me try that one. Oh, no, you, you wouldn't like that one, Jackie. Uh, that is a very, very old one left here by a wandering gypsy. I'm sure you wouldn't like that one. But I want it. I want to try that very old violin. Very well, Jackie, if you insist. Here. But I am sure you won't like it. Maybe I will. Let me see. Why, why, it's beautiful. This is the violin for me. I don't want any other one. This is the one I must have. Oh, I was afraid this might happen. Very well, Jackie, you may have it. But I must warn you, the gypsy who left this violin with me warned me that it had a curse put on it. A curse that says that whoever plays this violin shall become a great violinist. But if he ever plays the flight of the bumblebee on this violin, a terrible thing will happen. The flight of the bumblebee by Rimsky-Korsakov? Why, I play that piece very well. But you must never play it on this violin. If you do, something horrible might happen. You may take the violin only if you promise never to play the flight of the bumblebee on it. Very well, Mr. Schultz. I promise. Well, I took the violin and went home. It had a beautiful tone. And as the years passed, I got better and better. Finally, Professor LeBlanc felt that I was ready for the concert stage, and I made my first appearance before a crowd of a thousand people. I played Sigoyneweisen by Sarah Saki.
Well, my first concert was a big success, and I went on a tour, playing before many audiences. The crowd often asked me to play the Flight of the Bumblebee, but remembering the old violin maker's words about the curse, I never did. I played almost everything else, though. Concerto in G minor by Bruch. I played Humoress by Dvorak. I played that beautiful piece for violin, Meditation from Thais by Massenet.
and finally the very difficult Rondo Capriccioso by Sanson. <laughs>
By that time, the world knew that I was a great violinist, and I was finally invited to play at Carnegie Hall in New York City. This was the biggest night of my life, and I was determined to give the greatest concert of my career. The hall was full. As I walked out on the stage, a hush fell over the audience. Ladies and gentlemen, I am going to play the last movement of Mendelssohn's Violin Concerto.
Never had I played so well. I was certain that the critics would say that it was the finest performance of the Mendelssohn Concerto ever given. But as I walked back on the stage to take my place, I noticed a strange murmuring among the audience. And finally, they began to yell at me. Play the B! Yes, play the flight of the bumblebee. Please play the flight of the bumblebee. Ladies and gentlemen, quiet, please. Thank you. Thank you. For an encore, I would like to play Malaguena by Sarasati. They liked the encore very much, but they still wouldn't quiet down. Come on, play the B, will you? Don't you know how to play the B? Yeah. Oh, you just don't know how to play the B. Come on, Goodness, what will I do? I know I can play it better than anyone else, and faster, too. I wonder what old Schultz meant about that curse. Probably just a lot of nonsense. I'll do it. I'll show them whether I can play the flight of the bumblebee or not. I'll play it so they'll never forget it. Ladies and gentlemen, quiet if you please. Ladies and gentlemen, I am going to play The Flight of the Bumblebee.
Well, I played it, and nothing happened. I knew there was nothing to that story about a curse on the violin. Nothing to it at all. Now I can play the flight of the bumblebee every place. Everything was fine until I got home that night. I took my violin out of its case to clean it with a cloth, and then put it under my chin to play just a little before going to bed. But as I played, as I played, this is what I seemed to hear. You have disobeyed me, Jack. Played the bee when you shouldn't have, Jack. Now I say you must go back, back to where you started, Jack. Started, Jack. Started, Jack. And back to where you started, Jack. Why? Why, my violin seemed to be talking to me. Said something about, oh, I must go back to where I started. Back to where I started? I wonder what that means. Oh, this is silly. A violin can't talk. Must have been my imagination. I'll go to bed and forget about it. Well, the next night I was supposed to give another concert. I had about forgotten what had happened the night before thinking it was just my imagination, or a dream. Anyway, the concert was about to begin, and taking my violin under my arm, I walked out on the stage, put the violin under my chin, and started to play. Oh my goodness. What's the matter with me? Something had happened. I couldn't play well at all. I couldn't play any better than I'd played years ago when I had just started. Just started. That's it. Back to where you started, Jack. That's what the violin had meant last night. It was true. There was a curse on me now. I had played the flight of the bumblebee. Now I'd have to go back to where I started. I was frantic, but I kept trying to play in front of all those people. <laughs> Finally, they began to laugh at me. But I wouldn't stop. I kept trying and trying. broken man. I couldn't believe that I had lost my power to play. I tried again at home in my study, but it was no use. I was back to where I was when I was just starting, just as the violin had said. So you see why I don't play the violin too well today. I had to learn all over again. Mary, I said, now you see why I don't play the violin too well today. Mary, Mary, you've been asleep. You haven't heard a word I said. Oh, well, maybe it's just as well. You kids who've been listening, let's just keep this to ourselves. We'll make it our little secret, huh? Till I've had a chance to get good on the violin again. Even if I never can play The Flight of the Bumblebee, it shows you when you make a promise, you should keep it. No telling what will happen if you don't. Now, where's my fiddle? I have a lot of time to make up, so might as well get in a little practicing. <laughs> 